very warm welcome to our morning service here in Seymour Street. Um, and you're especially welcome if you're joining us online, especially if you're on your holidays. Um, just uh, two announcements this morning. Um, the first one is actually just to let everyone know that David's going to be on holiday from the 5th to the 26th of July. Um, and during that early couple of weeks, um, Shirley will be available for any pastoral emergencies. But then Shirley's going to be on holiday from the 25th of July to the 2nd of August. <laughs> Shirley, we'll miss you. We'll miss you. And um, uh, during that week, um, the 19th to the 25th of July, um, Reverend Edmund Winnie has kindly agreed to be available for any pastoral emergencies. And then just, um, we're having a summer scheme running from the 4th to the 7th of, uh, of August. Um, the great news is that all, of, all the kids' places have gone, so it's obviously proving very popular, um, but we do need some adult um, helpers during that time. So if you're available, could you please contact Ashley, and if you could possibly do that by the 9th of July. I'll hand over to David. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Good morning. Um, just before we, we move into the, the service this morning, I just want to mention that this morning's service will include Holy Communion. If you're watching online and plan to participate in that, then please do have bread and wine or juice to, to do that uh, so that you're able to participate alongside us here in the building this morning. Uh, so that's just so that you can take a moment to, to, to have that ready. The other thing to say is that the part of the service where we celebrate communion uh, will be taken down from Facebook shortly after the service today. So if you're watching later, um, that will no longer be available. Just some words from Psalm 63 as uh, we come to worship God. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. And we're going to lift our voices in song as uh, we sing our opening hymn. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
Let's pray together. Holy, holy, holy God, our Heavenly Father, we come with thankful hearts this day, thankful for Jesus, thankful for the sacrifice of himself for our salvation, thankful for your constant and real presence with us, thankful for your majesty and for your strength, for your rule and reign over all which gives us peace to rest in you. Thankful for the tiny details of everyday life that reveal your goodness to us again and again that are new every morning. And Lord, today again, we come mindful that it is only by grace that we enter your presence that we can't stand before you trusting in ourselves and what we have done or what we can do, but trusting only in Jesus and what he has done for us through his life and death and resurrection and in what he has revealed to us of your heart and your desire to make us part of your family through him. And Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are present here just as you are present in every place and in every moment of our lives. But Lord, we invite you to reveal your presence to us in a special way as we gather together to worship. We ask that you would reveal yourselves, reveal yourself in, in whispers to our spirits in gentle nudges that speak of the work that you desire to do in us and to do through us, stirring us to repentance, stirring us to truly worship you, stirring us to lay down our lives as servants of Jesus, prepared to do what it takes to follow you, no longer content with what's comfortable or what suits us, but with following Jesus on our own terms but willing to give our lives for his sake and for his glory just as he was willing to give our uh, give his for our redemption so trinity god help us to go beyond superficial shallow faith and even today to take a first step or a further step towards truly finding our rest in you. For in the name of Jesus, we ask it. And in his name, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Nethel's going to read for us from God's word. Our reading this morning is from St. Matthew, chapter 11, 25 to 30. And Jesus said, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, I thank you because you have shown to the unlearned what you have hidden from the wise and learned. Yes, Father, this was how you were pleased to have it happen. My Father has given me all things no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are tired from carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and put it on you, and learn from me, 
because I am gentle and humble in spirit, and you will find rest. For the yoke I give you is easy, and the load I will put on you is light. This is the word of the Lord. So let's unite our hearts together as we pray for others. Let's pray. Uh, God, our Father in heaven, this morning we come before you specifically as we pray for others. This morning we are mindful of the things that are going on in our world. Some things seem crazy, some are really hard to take in and understand, and some just leave us speechless. Help us to remember that in all things, all things, God, you are in control. We pray this morning for those affected by the fires in Canada. These really hot temperatures are causing so much harm and concern. Comfort those affected by this situation. God, we all love a bit of heat and sun, but this is wild. And we ask that you will deal graciously with those who have lost homes and livelihoods. We remember the firefighters who are dealing with this particular situation. Bless and protect them. In fact, God, would you bless all firefighters all over the world as they carry out dangerous and essential work for the good of others. And God, we remember this morning those affected by the landslide in the city in Japan undertake in this awful situation. And God, we continue to remember Ethiopia and all the other places on this your earth that are dealing with major issues, should it be famine, drought, or war, lifting up to you again the world situation with COVID-19. Deal graciously, God, and in your mercy hear our prayers. We remember, Lord, our own wee land and its situation politically. And God, it's a real handling. But bless all those who govern. Give wisdom and understanding, we pray. And so, God, this morning, we think of those known to us who are struggling. Whether they're struggling with health issues, financial issues, emotional issues, mental health, unemployment, loss, or those who just, they're just not at the top of their game at this time. Help all in need to reach out to you. And for those, Lord, who can't sleep at night, remind them that you are always close at hand. Enable folk, whatever they face, to experience you in a new and fresh way. Enable them to lean into you and they will find you faithful in every way. Dear God, forgive our foolishness, our doubt, our inability to trust you. Help us to be the people you want us to be, giving you all the glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing again, and it's Dear Lord and Father of Mankind.
Let's pray for a moment. Father, we ask that as we still our souls, calm our spirits, that, Lord, we would hear your voice. In Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder, have you ever questioned the sincerity of a preacher whenever they stand up and say, I'm preaching this more to myself than to you? Could we have a show of hands on that? <laughs> yep, that tells me that all except Susanna are either very naive or else very dishonest. Uh, but let me assure you, that as I use that expression uh, and say what I share this morning is very much something that's speaking to my own heart, uh, at least on this occasion, um, I'm absolutely sincere because the passage that we're, we're looking at today is one that has dwelt with me for many years now. I've referred to it often here before as well. And yet I, I still don't know if I'm actually really any closer in my own life uh, to mo truly moving forward in response to what Jesus says here. And we're really picking up a tiny part of the message of these few verses this morning because uh, if you want to understand what is truly at the heart of Christian discipleship, uh, then these verses are one of the really key places to go. There is so much here uh, in math at the end of Matthew chapter 11. But what I would say reflects a lot of the frustrations and questions that I have with my own life and with my own relationship with God. And it's certainly not me saying, uh, since I know and I've applied this, now I'm going to pass it on to you. That's not it at all. Uh, and lots of what I'm sharing today uh, is borrowed from people like Dallas Willard and John Ortberg and John Mark Comer uh, and others. I can claim very little original thought. Uh, in, in any of this. I'm not sure whether you've, asked, you, you've really sat down and thought about all of the people in the Bible who God asks to do things for him. There's one thing that, that seems to run through, a thread that runs through all of those encounters, the people that God calls uh, and he says, go here or do that. There's one thing that seems to be consistent with all of these people. God never asks them to do things that are particularly easy. Always seems that he asks people to do hard things. God never comes to Abraham or Moses or Joseph or Jeremiah or Esther and says, I'd like you to do me a favor, but it shouldn't take much time. I don't really don't want to inconvenience you very much. God always seems to be intrusive and demanding and exhausting. And Jesus carries on the same theme. He, he comes to the disciples and he says, in this world, you will have trouble. He says that we should expect the world to be hard. We should expect that our assignments will be hard. I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. Take up your cross and follow me. Now, we looked at that idea, I suppose, a few weeks ago uh, of how there's this tension between salvation being free and the fact that there's a cost to discipleship. And Jesus makes it really clear that the assignments that he gives uh, living as a follower of Jesus uh, 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 are not assignments that involve us doing that on our own terms, uh, doing what suits us. It just means uh, that if that's the way we look at discipleship, then we're not truly following Jesus, the mission he sends us on is not easy. It's as hard, it's hard, it's as hard as it gets. But what he does say is, my yoke is easy. So how does that line up? Uh, on one hand, does the God of all of the people of the Bible, and then Jesus as he comes in the form of uh, a man to earth, how is it that the people who follow are given horrendously hard assignments to do, and yet Jesus can say, my yoke is easy? How do those two things line up? Aren't they complete contradictions in terms? Because Jesus doesn't come ta uh, teaching what I ask you to do will be easy. He doesn't come saying living as a follower in, uh, in the world, as my follower in the world, 
will be easy, but he does come saying, my yoke is easy. Now, I don't want to insult your intelligence, but neither do I want to leave anyone behind. So I want to make sure we know what Jesus means by a yoke. Uh, now, where I grew up in Tyrone, and I suspect Shirley will have no bother following this, whenever I was in my teens and you talked about a yoke, very often you meant one of these. Uh, or sometimes one of these. That really is some yoke. Uh, but of course, what Jesus and those listening to him had in mind was one of these. Uh, and these were only placed upon an animal whenever there was work to be done. Often hard work tiring work, relentless work. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So instantly in the minds of those who are listening, when he says, take my yoke upon you, with the very word yoke being mentioned, they are thinking work, they are thinking burden. But Jesus says his yoke is easy. Jesus isn't the giver of easy work. He's the giver of the easy yoke. Jesus doesn't say, I'm going to give you a holiday or I will give you a mattress or I will give you a comfort blanket to help you sleep. Instead, he says, I will give you a yoke. So apparently this rest he has for us doesn't equate to leisure or to laziness. It isn't about fitting uh, in with the little box that we have allocated for God in our lives. He's got work for us to do. And Bible scholars over the years have drawn out that when Jesus talks about the easy yoke, that the word for easy is more to do with the concept of something that is perfectly formed and, and perfectly shaped for us as the individuals we are, rather than just easy in the normal way that we tend to understand it. And that's certainly part of it. But especially as Jesus goes on to say that his burden is light, it seems to me that there's something more to it than just having an implement that doesn't chafe on our shoulders. The, the commentator Douglas Hare uh, helps us imagine Jesus' invitation with his translation of these verses. Uh, and think of the image of the, the two yoked oxen as you hear these words. Become my yoke mate and learn how to pull the load by wor working beside me and watching how I do it. You carry what you can, Jesus says, and I'll carry the rest. We are going to work together here to move your life to where it's supposed to be. Jesus isn't just saying, it's not just that your heavy load won't bring you out in blisters. He's saying there are actually times whenever I am yoked with you as your partner in your assignment and mission for, uh, for me, there are times when I will take the load for you. My yoke is easy. And easy is a soul word. We each have an outer life and an inner life. We each have a, 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 an outer self where we have the public, visible me, my accomplishments, my work, my reputation lie there. My inner life is where my secret thoughts and hopes, where my wishes live, where uh, and because that inner life is invisible, it's easy to neglect. No one has direct access to it, so it wins no applause. And sometimes we think about our soul being a small part of us, when actually it's the whole of us. Dallard Willis wrote that, uh, Willard wrote this, what is running your life at any given moment is, is your soul, not external circumstances, not your thoughts, not your intentions, not even your feelings, but your soul. The soul is that aspect of your whole being that correlates, integrates, and enlivens everything going on in the various dimensions of the self. The soul is the life center of human beings. And he goes on, if your soul is healthy, no external circumstance can destroy your life. If your soul is unhealthy, no external circumstance can redeem your life. 
easy is a soul word. It's not a, a, a circumstance word. It's not a project word. It's not a job word. If we want and try to have easy circumstances, very often we find that life will be hard all around. But if we seek to have an easy soul, then our capacity for tackling hard tasks will actually grow. The soul was not made for an easy life. The soul was made for an easy yoke. In other words, easy doesn't come from the outside. Easy comes from the inside. Easy does not describe the problems that I face. Easy describes the strength from beyond myself by which I can carry my problems. And if we try to cultivate a life that is easy on the inside, we will be able to handle all kinds of difficult on the outside. John Ortberg says, the more inward ease that I live in, the more outward hard I can handle. And an easy soul needs rest. The soul craves rest. Now again, it's so important that we don't equate rest with laziness and leisure. Soul rest is different. Our wills sometimes rejoice in striving, and yes, our bodies were made to at least uh, sometimes know the exhilaration of tremendous challenge. Our minds get stretched uh, whenever they must focus, even when they are tired. But the soul craves rest. The soul knows only borrowed strength. The soul was made to rest in God the way a tree rests in soil. Jesus says, come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Notice what he says immediately after he mentions rest. He goes on, walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. There's just something in those words that make us crave what they're talking about. We long for the type of easiness that they describe. But if soul rest is what we need in order to deal with the chaos of life, how do we experience it? Jesus says, walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. What are these rhythms of grace that we see in Jesus' life? I'm just picking up a few things. There are so many more too. We'll mention just in passing. The third is where we're going to focus. First is the grace of acceptance. Jesus lived in the knowledge of his father's absolute and complete acceptance on two occasions in the story of the life of jesus we have recorded that god spoke this is my son whom i love with him i am well pleased those two occasions are recorded but that was something that jesus heard every day and he lived in the grace rhythm of god's acceptance for jesus identity and acceptance come before achievement and ministry he's not accepted because of what he does he's accepted because of who he is and so are we this is joy that no one can take away. We can't earn acceptance, and yet God accepts us freely because Jesus has lived and died and risen for us. And living in that acceptance is, is essential for our souls to be at rest. Second thing is the grace of being sustained. And the idea is that, that, that Jesus engaged in certain practices that allowed God's grace to keep replenishing his spirit. Uh, some of them are, are things we'd expect. He prayed. Uh, he engaged in regular, regular corporate worship at the synagogue. He fed his mind with the scripture. But some sustaining practices of Jesus perhaps don't, uh, we don't always appreciate these. He had a circle of close friends, the 12 who went through life with him. Uh, the three who were in that inner circle, he, he, he shared everything with them. I think we often uh, underestimate the rule of friendship in the life of Jesus. He enjoyed God's creation, mountain, garden, uh, and lake. He took long walks. He gave time to and spent time with the children. 
that he met. He enjoyed parties with non-religious people. Common problem is that, that we so often think of, of spiritual practices as things that we really don't want to do, but we feel we have to do them because God's making us do them. We think they're things that are really going to drain us. But each of us need to engage in practices that connect us to God's grace and energy and joy. Now, it might be going to the sea. It might be listening to music that just lifts our hearts. It might be being with life-giving friends, taking a long walk, but doing all of them with Jesus and looking for him in them test of a sustaining spiritual practice is, does it fill me with grace for life? What are our sustaining practices? Maybe it's time that each of us explored a few new ones. But the place that I want us to think of most deeply that we see clearly in the rhythms of grace that characterize Jesus' life is the grace of significance. Now, this sits very uh, closely with the first one, with the grace of acceptance, but there's a subtle distinction. Uh, this third rhythm involves grace not just flowing into us, but now also through us and out to others for their sake. And all of this too is a gift of God's grace. Do we know who we are? Apart from money, power, reputation, whatever it is. As Jesus began his ministry, his very first temptation took place after he'd been told by the Father, this is my son whom I love. In the, very ne in the next verse, Jesus goes into the, the wilderness. The evil one says to him, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down from the temples. In other, uh, temple. In other words, don't listen to the voice. Don't uh, trust grace. Don't believe your father. You prove it. You prove who you are, Jesus. You earn it. You make it happen. You make it about you. And Jesus said no. Temptation depended on G being able to get Jesus to question his identity, to feel as if he had to prove his identity by doing spectacular things that would set him apart and mark him out as superior to everybody else, or to everybody else. <coughs> Excuse me. Significance is about who we are before it is about what we do. And what we might not first perceive from that is that the grace of significance liberates us from the need to hurry. Thomas Willard points out in his writings that there is a world of difference between being busy and being hurried. Being busy is an outward condition. It's a, it's a condition of the body. It happens whenever we have lots of things to do. Busyness is almost inevitable in our world. Most people are busy people. There are, there are limits to how much busyness we can tolerate. But by itself, busyness is not lethal. Being hurried is an inner condition, a condition of the soul. It, me it means to be so preoccupied with myself and my life that I'm not able to be fully present with God, with myself, and with other people. I'm unable to occupy this present moment. Busyness drifts to become hurry when we let it squeeze God out of our lives. I cannot live in the kingdom of God with a hurried soul. I cannot rest in God with a hurried soul. Jesus was often busy, but he was never hurried. And more than that, he seemed to be quick to detect those who, uh, who suffered with hurry sickness. Once, whenever he had sent his disciples out on a mission, 
They, they returned to him to report what they had done and taught. Imagine being one of Jesus' closest followers, uh, given the privilege of sharing this message of love and forgiveness. You've just completed a, 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 a job successfully. You're wondering what your next mission will be. It's not like there's not lots of work to be done. There are so many needy people who are coming to Jesus. Uh, and Jesus, uh, according to the, the scriptures, sometimes didn't even have a chance to eat. So what's the next task that Jesus gives to his willing followers? What's the next step? Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Instead of hurrying on to the next thing, Jesus got everyone into the boat uh, and they went off to what was recorded as a solitary place. What, but what about the mission to, to save the world? What about the sick people who needed to be healed? Jesus knew the power of a rested soul. He slowed his followers down so their souls wouldn't become fatigued. We seem to spend most of our time trying to please crowds. Jesus seemed to spend most of his time trying to get away from them. An arrested soul is the easy yoke. Our souls exist integrate our lives so that we can live in harmony with God and the world. Of course, our soul was not made to stay in the quiet place forever. But we can bring some of that rest and wholeness with us into our noisy world. The psalmist says our job is not to heal our souls, but to make space so that God's healing can come. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. Where are our green pastures? Where are our still waters? Rest for our souls comes in the place of quietness and in the place of solitude. Back in the Garden of Eden, the perfect home for the soul, God modeled for us the need for rest. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. On the seventh day, he rested from all his work. The notion of rest was and is still God's idea. And the opposite of the rhythm of grace is what we might what might be called the rhythm of works. In this, I simply go backwards against the tide of grace. I begin by trying to achieve my impressive accomplishments through my strength, through my ego. I hope that by doing this, I might then feel significant. I hope that this sense of significance will sustain me through all the difficulties and stresses of life. And ultimately, I hope that the end result will be a life that is somehow acceptable to somebody. The rhythm of works will destroy our soul. It's the hard yoke. It's the heavy burden. But when my soul is at rest, it occupies uh, the throne of my life. My will is undivided and obeys God with joy. My mind has thoughts of truth and beauty. I desire what is wholesome and good. My body is filled with appetites that serve the good, with habits that lead me into real living. My soul is at rest to remain healthy, to remain easy. Our souls need space with no agenda and no distraction. We often hear quoted that famous line from St. Augustine's Confessions, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. But I think we're guilty, especially in the Protestant tradition, of reducing the meaning of that and saying that our hearts are restless until we find salvation and forgiveness in Jesus, which of course it is true, but I believe Augustine knew, as Jesus certainly knew and modeled for us, that even as we have placed our faith and trust in God, that our souls are still restless, that our souls are not easy, and that we cannot experience the easiness of Jesus' yoke until we discover the rest that comes from living in the rhythm of God's unending grace with an unhurried soul. John Ortberg writes of a time when he asks Dallas Willard, someone who's been widely recognized as being one of the most godly individuals of her times. He asked him, what was the single most important piece of advice he could give him about living life as a disciple of Jesus? And this was his considered reply. The single thing, uh, the most important thing to live as a disciple of Jesus, ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. 
John Mark Comer has written a book on the, with that title based on that phrase. It's a great read on this subject if you want to, uh, to pick that up. But ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Not busyness, that's almost inevitable. But eliminate hurry because hurry is a soul killer. Hurried soul makes an easy yoke hard. A hurried soul makes every burden feel heavy. And so my challenge today to you and also maybe especially to me is how will we ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our lives? How will we learn to live in the rhythm of God's grace? How will we find a rested soul? For if we can find that, we will discover that no matter how difficult the tasks are that face us, no matter how relentless and busy and unyielding our circumstances, we will find the truth of those words of Jesus. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We're coming to the Lord's table uh, in the midst of everyone else who's here. It's an opportunity to be alone with God, an opportunity to experience afresh his grace in our lives, his acceptance, his sustenance, the significance that we have in him, an opportunity to eliminate hurry, opportunity to know his rest in our souls. We're going to take a very simple approach to communion today. We're going to use very little liturgy, but rather just still our hearts and use this time to respond to God's call to rest in him. I'm going to pray then we're going to play a song as we take time to to be still and prepare our hearts before him as we come to the table but unfortunately uh, we're going to have to stop the live stream for those who are watching online while we play that song or else facebook will block the broadcast for us Uh, but we've put a link on facebook uh, so that you can listen to that yourself but uh, and if you're watching the facebook feed a new uh, video will appear after the song finishes but just let's use this space Uh, to still our hearts and let's make this a first step in living in the rhythm of God's grace and rest. We'll pray first uh, and then we'll uh, still our hearts as we listen. Father, you know uh, the, the restlessness of our souls, restlessness of our hearts. And Lord, you've designed us with souls that crave to rest in you. But Father, you also know the circumstances that surround us, the seeming chaos of our lives. So Lord, in our busyness, would you help us to ruthlessly eliminate the hurriedness within our spirit? And God, would you move us to a place where we can rest in you so that we might know that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Meet us here as we remember you together.